I represent Hip Hop for Change. I am the education director of this uh, organization called Hip Hop for Change. We are a 501c3 based out of Oakland. We've been around for about eight years. Uh, we have taught 25,000 students all around the Bay Area and throughout the world, not only um, all the expressive elements of hip hop, but also the history, culture, and power of hip hop. Um, just kind of our contribution to the larger collective in terms of culturally responsive pedagogy and um, meeting students where they're at. So I'm gonna give you a really quick synopsis of the birth of hip hop. For all those, are there any hip hop heads in the building? Anybody who listens to hip hop, anybody considers themselves part of the hip hop community? I just wanna check, cause this will serve as a refresher to you all. But if you're not, then this will be something brand new and I'm excited to teach you all about. So hip hop as a culture, right? We all are familiar with the music. Hip hop as a culture starts in the early 1970s, specifically 1973. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, it starts as a unique form of DJing. It was a woman by the name of Cindy Campbell, who in her entrepreneurial prowess, tried to put together a back to school jam as a means of raising money for her um, to, to, uh, to buy school clothes. And in doing so, she employed her brother, Clive Campbell, to DJ this party that was gonna take place at 1520 Cedric Avenue in the South Bronx um, as, a, uh, as in the, yes, perfect, exactly. Um, in the community center of their building. It's at this party that DJ Cool Herc, having come from Jamaica in 1968 and is very um, growing, an affinity towards funk music. He develops this unique style of DJing. He then called the merry-go-round style of DJing. The idea in this was that he was taking the break beats, basically the percussive aspects of different obscure funk records, and he was playing them one after the other in order to extend this beat break as a performance style of DJing that got people uh, more hype, they would be done at the height of the party where everybody was having a really great time. This style of DJing is what gives birth to what we now know as hip hop. The idea of remixing or taking obscure songs and remixing them in order in a performance style to uh, to create a different vibe, a different in uh, a different environment in the party. This eventually evolved into all the other cultural. Of artistic forms of expression that would happen throughout the party. Aside from the DJ, you would also have MCs getting on the microphone, hosting the party, giving them a little call and response and raps. So that became the MC. You would also have people um, dancing to these breaks of records, otherwise known as break dancers, all doing this at the same time. Amidst all of this, you would also have graffiti writers not only creating live art, but throughout the neighborhoods in the Bronx and all throughout New York City, you would have graffiti writers kind of not only creating tag names for themselves, but also creating murals and other art pieces with social statements. Now, all of this represents what we call the five elements of hip hop and the four principles. So the five elements as we just discussed are DJing, break dancing, MCing, graffiti art, and knowledge being the fifth element. This is also paired with what we like to call the four principles. The four principles kind of served as community agreements in terms of how young people were gonna conduct themselves in the space that was the hip hop jam. So the four principles are, as you see, peace, love, unity, and having fun. Um, I like to say that these were the four agreements before the book, the four agreements, if you're familiar with that. Otherwise, they served as community agreements in terms of how the, um, the youth were going to conduct themselves in the party and at the party. So as it relates to graffiti writing specifically, what you see over the course of the last, you know, 40 years is how this culture has kind of permeated pop culture. Starting with tagging, which was considered vandalism back in New York City in the early days, and then it became a little bit more legitimized as artists were creating elaborate murals that spoke to a specific kind of genius in the terms, in the usage of color, in the uses of shapes, in the usage of letters. I always like to say graffiti is American calligraphy. So you had some standout artists during the 1980s, people like Keith Haring, people like John Michelle. Michelle Basquiat and others who were creating elaborate murals all throughout New York City, becoming the toast of the art world, even contemporaries with people like, like um, Andy Warhol, in order to collaborate and work on different art pieces, different murals and different commissioned art pieces all throughout the city. To this day, some of their work is still maintained as landmarks in New York City, and some of these artists are known worldwide. Keith Haring, for example, was um, 
his work has been used as the main aesthetic in the AIDS awareness campaign. Jean-Michel Basquiat is heralded as one of the more influential, more well-known artists of the 20th century, and he's been gone and left, uh, he's, he's left us for about 20 some odd years or more almost 40 years. And just last year, two years ago, one of his paintings was sold on, on the market for $110 million, one of the most expensive art pieces ever um, ever sold. Uh, further to that, I just want to shout out Fab Five Freddy, who was commissioned to do a lot of the art murals in the New Wave punk rock clubs in downtown Manhattan. And had it not been for Fab Five Freddy, we would not see the synergy between what was going on in the Bronx with the DJs in the Bronx, Africa Bambata, Grandmaster Flash, Cool Herc, coming down into lower Manhattan and mixing and merging with the new age punk rock kids in those clubs. And this is how hip hop began to spread throughout the city and the rest of the world.